this year, this year's History Month series. Alice Kerman, CFS Class of 2002, is an account supervisor for Accenture Interactive, managing a team of digital project specialists on site at Merck Pharmaceuticals. He has 11 years of marketing experience. Prior to this, Mr. Kerman worked as a senior marketing specialist with the Wall Street Journal for five years, building media and marketing strategies for clients in the technology, finance, energy, education, and healthcare industries, and as an account executive at Ogilvy's and Mathers on the IBM account, developing digital demand generation campaigns. He graduated from Emory University in 2006 with a BBA in marketing and finance. With that being said, let's give a warm first firm school welcome to Mr. Alex Kerman. So how my parents came up, my father was one of eight kids, South Jersey, and for lack of a better word, came from a very poor family. Uh, came up with Irish Catholic upbringing, not a lot of money to go around, but the best that they could offer him was a good Catholic education. So he worked hard, put himself through school, and was able to make something for himself. My mother, on the other hand, came a nice middle class family, you know, had two parents, took care of him, but by the time she reached her 20s, those parents were gone. So when my parents met each other, they had each other, and that was about it. Not a lot of financial support, just you know what they had in their pockets and the will to survive and raise a family. And that's where we came in. So looking at what shaped my life, my views, how I came into this world, was two people that believe that hard work can take you places, that it's not where you start, it's where you end up, uh, and all the work that you put in to get there along the way. So those are the values that I grew up with, was that no matter what you were given, that putting in the effort, no matter where you end up, can take you somewhere. So that takes me on my road to church farm, so where to go from there. I grew up, luckily that my father had a pretty good starting job, uh, be able to take care of us, but beyond that, we didn't have a safety net. You know, we shopped at the thrift store, we you know, had meals at Denny's, we had you know, a pretty modest upbringing. And then over time, as we moved along, we were able to achieve some success, and by the time I was able to find my CFS story, we were lucky enough to be in a good place that my father could make sure that I came here uh, to get a good education, get a better education, and we thought I could get in the public school system. So all of his hard work, doing what all of your parents want to do, which puts you on a road to a better path, to do better than they did. And I was lucky enough to get that. Along the way, in terms of you know my interactions with diversity, grew up in the coastal school district early on. So you had diversity around you, but it was on paper. It was you go into class, you went to big classrooms, you interacted with people. And that was about it on a day-to-day -day basis. You know, it was just the general hi, how you doing, you know, day to day. But you weren't really getting to know the people around you. You weren't really getting to understand who they were and where they were coming from. Probably the, the closest thing I had coming up was to my church. Um, Similar to the history that we're celebrating right now, about 50 years ago, uh, the church my parents went to was uh, one of two churches in the, in the coastal area that was facing an issue where they were only half full. And the big thing at that time was obviously they were racially segregated churches. So what they said is, guys, you can join or you can die. And so they joined. And so by the time I came there, by the time I came up, we had 30, 40 years of people coming together in worship and getting to know each other, getting to understand each other. And through that, build strong bonds. And that's the environment that I came up with. So that's why when I saw Church Farm, that was something that was familiar to me. That idea of having a community of people from all different walks of life. It's not about 
uh, you know, racial, socioeconomic, gender. It's people there for common good and common purpose, uh, trying to achieve something, looking out for each other. So there was none of those barriers and borders that we find in many of the other places of our life. So that brings the question then. So if diversity is a great thing, and we, we, we admit it's a great thing, we talk about it conceptually, because we'll all say it, diverse talent, right? You never build a team, you know, unless you're the Sixers, of you know, all players of one size or one skill type. You know, you look for a diversity of talent, you look for people from all different walks to be different things. We agree in a diversity of ideas. You never want to do a group project and have one person be the only one leading it. You want everyone to contribute and tell you you know, what they think about it, their point of view on what's going on out there. We all agree on that general concept. So why is it so hard then, as a society, to kind of embrace these cultures, these cultural identities, to embrace diversity the way we want it to be? And part of it is, is it's, it's a little bit biological, and that's not meant to be a cop-out to say we don't have control over what we do, but realizing that as people, as human beings, our evolution and what we've done with ourselves has, has almost accelerated faster than our bodies and minds can keep up with. We're creating technology and social structures and different things that we're constantly trying to incorporate and understand in our daily lives. So there's two kind of basic primordial concepts that make it a little hard sometimes for us to get along when you think about it. And one of it is sort of your familiarity bias, right? So whatever you grew up with, whatever you're comfortable with, is, is what you like, is what you're used to, and whether that's um, the people around you when you grew up, it, it could be a lot of different things that kind of set the tone for how you view the world, the way you were brought up sets a certain point of view. And we build our, our lives and our values based upon that. And that's almost like a tribal instinct, right? I'm from one tribe, you're from another. If you're like me, okay, I know you're good and you're not gonna steal my food and kind of kill me or something, you know? Versus if someone's from another tribe, I don't know you, I don't understand where you're coming from. So I'm, I'm wary of you. And we still have these instincts baked up into us every now and again that says, you know, I'm a little afraid of something that's different. So that makes it harder for us. That means we have to stop and actually think about things. We can't react instinctually. We actually have to think through the moment. Another big piece that makes it a little hard for us is that we're built for efficiency as people. We're built, you think about it in sports, you do the same thing over and over and over again. Suddenly you're doing things without thinking about it. It's a reflex action. The same thing goes with your mind. Your mind likes efficiency. You'll find adults, and they won't admit this, but after years and years of driving, every now and then you'll get in the car, and you'll suddenly get where you're going, and you're like, how did I get here? I don't, I don't even remember. I turned the car on, and then suddenly I was just at my destination. Because you've done it so many times that your mind went on autopilot. It knew what to do, it knew where to go, and it took you there. And that's the problem where our mind also likes to categorize things as well, like to put things in boxes for easy maneuverability. So a lot of times we like to shut things down and put them aside, not really understand what's going on or where they come from. So we'll, we like to put labels on things and we'll say, well, you're this and you're that, so that can easily make you categorize yourself here or here or here. And that way I don't have to think about it because your mind says, oh, don't worry about it. We'll take care of this for you. Don't think through these issues. Like, we've got this. So now you have to stop yourself. You have to take a moment and say, what am I really thinking in this moment? What am I really feeling about this? And it takes a little bit more time. And it is possible. It just takes that awareness, uh, that, that little extra effort to get you there. So those are kind of two things that, call, that I've noticed in our life that kind of need your reaction. And I think as I bring them up, over time, so we'll start to see and see where this is coming from, see where you can challenge your own perceptions. Which is where CFS comes in. What, what is it about CFS? What is it about diversity in here that's just a little bit different? Well, what it really does is it really breaks down some of those barriers, right? It breaks down some of what we're talking about here, some of those biases. Because what is the first thing it does? It takes you out of that comfortable environment. You know, you don't have necessarily a safety net behind you to reinforce all the things that you thought you knew before. You're in with other people that came from other places and you don't have your parents or your friends and others. You have to talk, you have to be together, you have to bond with each other through shared experiences, right? So whether you're on a sports team, whether you're in a class helping each other out, whether you're in a singing competition, you have to have each other's backs. So you have this dialogue going on, you're going back and forth <coughs> to understand in a way that breaks down those barriers, and that's something that 
is very unique. You know, you wonder why it takes, it's so hard for the rest of the world to grasp this idea because it's tough to do this at scale. It's not easy to, you know, we can't pick up people from all the different communities of the world and jam them into one place together to interact and do this. But here, in this kind of special place, we can do that. We can bring people together and help them really understand each other and challenge ourselves, challenge our preconceived notions because that's, that's the thing about diversity is it should be able to come in and if you have a, a way you think things are, you should, should be able to defend it and talk about it and at the very least, you'll come out with a better argument why your way makes sense. Or you may have a very persuasive look at the way someone else sees it and maybe you move a little bit along the way. But at the very least, you learn how to interact with people, right? Because once you get out of this, which this is this great safe space, and I use that term safe space in the mean of a safe space for ideas to really learn and understand each other in a way that when you go out there, you know, anyone that you meet here, you'll meet more of them out there. There's not an idea that, well, I don't like this person and I'm never really gonna have to deal with them again. It doesn't work that way. That person's gonna be your boss. They're gonna be your office mate. They're gonna be someone that you're gonna encounter at some point in life. So now's the time to develop the skills on how to deal with that, how to deal with people to understand them, to either understand them better and befriend them, to understand them better to work together with them, or understand them better to find a better way of having a dialogue about your values and what you understand, what they understand, and working together towards a better common good. And it's something that I think I was most shocked to see actually when I left here, because after years of this sort of environment of five years of spending time with people of very different backgrounds and having groups, whether it was, you know, my friends from the track team or class or, you know, guys working on computers, all those different kind of connections that we've made is that once you go out to college, it gets harder again. Now, it doesn't mean it can't work, but you'll feel some of those forces, you'll feel some of those old habits want to pull you back, want to pull you back in this easy way of thinking, want to pull you back in safe space where you don't have to keep questioning, challenging, and working on how to work better with each other. Um, so it, it just takes being aware and cognizant of, of what's going on once you leave here and making sure that you build those habits and you take them out and, it, and you keep them with you um, everywhere you go. And the biggest thing you can take away is really that ability to, to talk and emphasize and understand with another individual. It doesn't matter where they came from, doesn't matter what they do, doesn't matter, you know, anything else. Just the ability to have a basic human interaction with someone where you can form a positive connection that really carries an energy with it, carries something where, you know, a, a charge of change, to, to, so to speak, in terms of, you know, the way you can affect the world. I think that, you know, too often right now we're waiting for someone else, we're waiting for, you know, government to come out and say, okay, there's a magic ball, and when I write this, you know, everything's great, everything's good, everyone's happy. But the problem with that is we can't, it doesn't work that way, it doesn't work top down because no matter what's written up here, if it doesn't change people in their heart, it doesn't matter. So that's where you come into play. So whether you take these learnings and it's just in the way you treat someone on a day-to-day -day basis, whether it's the barista at the coffee shop, you know, whether it's one of your teachers, whether it's a friend, whether it's someone else, um, or you're able to bring these ideas, bring these ideals, a way of thinking and understanding out into that world to help the people that don't have this experience. You know, you're, they need your help in the world, educating and understanding what you're learning from each other here because they're still sitting in those safe havens. They're still sitting out there behind walls of, you know, cultivated Facebook feeds. They're sitting behind their TV sets. They're sitting in areas where they're not getting what you get here. So that's why it's on you in your day-to-day -day lives, whether it's just in your interactions, whether it becomes your job, whether it becomes your calling, to try and bring that out to the world. And I see that really in a couple of different, so I have a few stories, um, for example, where I would bring that up, and just things that have affected me, how I see that in practice. So about five years ago, I was working for Journal, we were um, putting on a big event for Xerox, one of our clients, and we were out in Las Vegas, and the I don't know, the CEO of Xerox is Ursula Burns. She's a very powerful woman, um, tech titans around the world, you'll see her in a lot of kind of big name lists. So someone that very much on paper, and if you look at this side by side, you couldn't have talked about kind of two different people in, 
based upon their places in life, based upon their backgrounds. So I get to this event as a sort of you know low level employee, and she comes over, she engages me, she talks to me, and she says, "Hi, how are you? I'm Ursula Burns. Nice to meet you. Who are you?" I said, "Oh, I'm Alex Crow. I'm the Wall Street Journal." And the first thing I think to myself is, "Said, wow, you know, she could have gone right by me. Like I." wouldn't have minded. I would have said, that's a powerful woman, she's here to be quiet, she's got a lot going on. Like, I would understand that. Because on paper, once again, different different ethnic backgrounds, different social stratus right now, different genders, all those things you could have used as excuses to stay in your safe space, to stay away, to go somewhere else, to do something different. But she didn't. She stopped. She talked, we talked for 30 minutes. We sat there and talked. We talked about New York City. We talked about, she grew up on the Lower East Side, her goal had always been to move to the Upper East because she said in my day, that's when you knew you made it. Your mom always said, you made it to the Upper East Side in New York, then you made it big time. We talked about how much the city had changed. We talked about just the world and life in general. And it really stuck with me, you know, someone that would actually take the time to come and connect with me, knowing that they'd probably never see me again, they'd never meet me again. And not only that, the next person she talked to after me, once again, wasn't the client. It was, the, it was the security guard working the door. She talked to him. And you could tell they had a familiarity as well. She knew his family. How are they doing? How are your kids? What's going on? Those little connections, and that's what I'm really trying to drive the point on here like that, are profound in the way that they can affect us and affect change. And just based upon that, years later, I still carry that with me and try to bring that same sense to all the interactions that I have as well. And that's what I hope that you can do the same. And so my own version of that is much smaller, much less Exciting. I was in a Dwayne Reed going across from work, and uh, I happened to be in a meeting in the day, and I was in a suit and tie, and uh, was going up to the pharmacist to get a prescription, and was chatting with her, and we shared a few jokes, and we were talking a little bit back and forth, and she said, you know, I just gotta say, I was having a terrible day, like just a horrible day, and literally this conversation has made my day better. She said, I, I was gonna write this day off, but I feel so much better after having this talk. And I think to myself, wow, how little did that cost me? How little did that do pleasantness? And a little bit of human kindness to get to know someone who once again, I'll probably never see again and never really affect. But in that moment, it would bring them a little bit of something that hopefully maybe they'll pass on to the next one and the next person and that chain of civility that you're able to enact on a day-to-day -day basis. So that's why I want you to leave here and think about, think about every interaction you have as that opportunity, that opportunity to connect with someone, to understand them, understand who they are, where they're coming from, and to affect that kind of change. I don't think we always realize how much power we have of all each other's lives. We don't really think about it. But when you do, it, it's a profound thing. Once you start, start down that path, it'll be hard to stop because it, it it's enriching and it's empowering knowing that you can make that difference. Uh, because there are other parts of your life where you may not feel in control, right? There are other things that'll be outside of your control. There's, you know, your health. There's all kinds of things that will happen to you in the world, good things, bad things, that are hard to control. But that's something you can, every time, using that opportunity to engage with someone and really understand them and take that. And it doesn't, and they're not all perfect, once again. You know, you can get do-overs. That's the thing, it's about repetition, right? Each time is a new instance. So if you messed up before, do it again, do it better, try harder, and take that as your key takeaway here. I think you'll learn so many other things, but I mean, that, that's a basic skill that I've now built personally into a career. I work every day as a project manager. I work with people very different from myself, from across the world, from all different walks of life. And that ability to talk to people, understand them, understand their hopes, their fears, their frustrations, and then work together towards a common goal is something that is amazes me on a day-to-day -day basis and I try to continue to live up to over and over again. So if nothing else you did here, I hope that that's something that you can look towards as well and work at on your own level and take that out to the world. Wherever it takes you, as I said, if it's a day-to-day -day interaction or whether it's a CEO of a Fortune 500 company, take that skill and make the world a better place. So that's my story. And now I'd like to hear you.